and I'm going to welcome Stephen Kolber from uh, Brunswick Secondary College. Hello, hello, people. Um, my first question is, why aren't you writing your reports right now? Um, that's more important than what we're doing right here. But failing that, I hope you got a cup of tea at the ready and such. Um, so I'm going to do the unpopular thing and talk about um, why I think disruption and innovation are things we should avoid. So, uh, or the language at least. So I'll start my timer, Megan, if you'd like to as well. Um, alrighty, so I'm going to take you a little bit through um, the dominant re rhetoric of education. So the new normal factory model. So Ken Robinson, high tech, high flip learning pi pivot. Well, we've been doing a lot of pivoting right now. Uh, blended learning and of course the main two uh, disruption and innovation. So disruptive innovation comes from this man, Clayton Christensen, who's only just recently passed away. Uh, and he said in 2008, now rather than uh, have anyone teach a class, you don't have to put up with crummy teachers, everyone can learn from the best. So that's definitely become true. Um, this lovely little piece from the New Yorker tells us um, about how the theory of disruptive innovation was based on shaky evidence and was poorly, basically it was a post hoc fallacy in the sense that you look at businesses that did well and after the fact you say that was a disruptive innovation. So if you want to read it, it's a very interesting book. Uh, seek it out, it's good fun. Uh, so in 2008, they talked about disrupting class and how disruptive innovation would change the way that the world learns. And uh, 12 years on, I think we can all agree that that has definitely uh, not occurred. Uh, and in the bottom left, you see Michael Horn who is a key contributor on the book and now runs the Christensen Institute, which is a business minded think tank that is very anti teacher. So COVID-19 remote learning, working from home. The question is, was this disruptive? And I would be positing that it was not uh, in the sense that technology remained the same. No new business models emerged and the only thing that was disrupted was the lives of human beings. Um, Digital education revolution, was that a disruptive innovation? I'd like to think it was, but I think realistically, maybe not. Mobile phone bans, I think maybe there's a potential that that was a disruptive innovation in that it's centered around human beings and behaviors being changed. Um, I think a really useful uh, thing to think about is the disruption of higher education. So we often say that teaching is a low chance of replacement in the future world of work. But sadly, higher education tells us something different. So if you think of what a online lecturer does, they do marking, but that's now outsourced to people other than the lecturers. They lecture via video and they don't run tutorials anymore. So they're free to do research and publications. This is something I think we have to be wary of as a teaching profession, because as soon as we start outsourcing these jobs, our job becomes at risk. So the coming disruption, this is from this year. Uh, and as it says here, uh, this is unprecedented, in, unprecedented and we're all in this together, which is Latin for we're lowering our prices, bitches, which is very true of what's happening in higher education. Uh, there was another university, but I'm not up to date yet, but uh, La Trobe University basically is uh, at risk of closing as a result of this and the COVID effects of disruption. Uh, so I think we should be, it behooves us to avoid the language of disruption and innovation at risk that we do indeed become so disrupted that we are no longer uh, serving our purpose, serving our job. So I would say don't seek to be disrupted or to innovate. Don't try and build capacity. Instead, uh, actually talk to people and try and make them better. Embrace the unknown and the unknowable and comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable is the job of education. Uh, if you haven't read it, I recommend you seek out Neil Salwin's paper, Minding Our Language, Why Education and Technology is Full of Bullshit and Why uh, and What Might Be Done About It. Uh, it's probably the best title for an academic paper I've ever read, and I recommend seeking it out. Um, it talks about a lot of the same concepts I'm tr attempting poorly to cover here. Um, so my simple question for disruption would be, uh, does your use of educational technology, I've got one minute, thank you, Megan. Uh, does it allow me to spend more time speaking to, listening to and engaging with my students? So those who know me know that I'm big into instructional video. So that's a technology that's been around for 10, 20 years, but it does serve this purpose in the sense that it allows me more time to engage with my students and to be more human in the classroom. Um, I like to think of our mate uh, Plato, Socrates back in the day, 
would they have thought of their, their schooling system, their approach to education as factory model? And would they have indeed have said, this would be wicked if we had iPads? Or is that is the reason that tech, that education is so undisruptible because the core kernel of people sitting in a room discussing things is something that's good? And in the last 10 seconds, uh, an important quote for us, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty and we must rise with the occasion. So next time you hear that, remember that that's what Abraham Lincoln said in 1862. And I'm just on time. All right, that's me. Thank you very much.